You're tuned into Holy Smokes, Cigars, Catholicism, and Conversation. Let my prayer arise and thy sight as incense. I'm your host, Dustin Quick, and this is episode number 66, The Pint, The Pipe, or Cigar, and The Cross, with Matt Frad, the illustrious Matt Frad, everybody. So before we get into today's episode, just a word about the official sponsor of the Holy Smokes podcast, Havana Palace on here on church road in windsor ontario for the best service finest cigars go see caesar and eli family owned and operated and they treat all their customers like family so i encourage you to uh if you could be so kind as to go to facebook.com slash havana palace and give their page a like i would greatly appreciate it well uh good afternoon ladies and gentlemen boys and girls uh again mr matt frad with uh, of pints with aquinas matt how are you doing this afternoon my brother I'm doing terrific. Do you live in Canada, do you? I do. I'm a I'm a good Commonwealth boy. Nice. I used to live in Ottawa. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what Canada's like these days, but when I lived there, I loved it. Well, uh, Win- Windsor's a border city to Detroit. I'm yeah. about 20 I've, minutes away, right? I've been there. Uh, it's it's okay. I live on the outskirts, though. The, the city life, it's kind of rough now, so I, I we moved out to the outskirts. <laughs> But uh, yeah. What are you What are you smoking? Right now, I have it's a budget smoke. It's a Bravos. It's a Nicaraguan. Mm-hmm. Um, I, all I All I can afford these days are budget sticks. But uh, I need to get into some budget sp- sticks because this is an expensive habit. This is my favorite cigar. I'd have to say right now, it's uh, Jacob's Ladder by Southern Draw. Nice. Okay. I think it's a Nicaraguan, but it's out of uh, out of Dallas, and I believe they're a Christian company because. Uh, all of their uh, smokes seem to be named after something biblical, and it's absolutely terrific. Yeah, I'll have to try that. Have you ever had an Ave Maria before? Yeah, they sent me a box, um, and it was quite good. Uh, yeah, so I liked it. The wrapper was sensational. Oh, I know, right? The wrappers are great. It was a Connecticut that they sent me. Right. Uh, so no it was fine yeah actually so they sent me the box and then i went to a party for easter and i took the box with me and i was very popular because i just shared it with everybody so. right right <laughs> well for my 21st birthday my dad uh he had um i'm, th- I'm going on 39 now so this was a while ago yeah but uh I'm 38 my, right right for my uh, 21st birthday my dad had a humidor just full of cohibas nothing else so I wanted to be the cool guy, and I passed these things out like candy to literally everybody there. By the end of the party, the humidor was empty. My dad goes to check it one day and notices all his cohibas are gone. Ooh. And I had no idea at the time, right, of the value of these things. Uh, but yeah, he wasn't he wasn't too happy with me after that. Let's just say <laughs> that that's amazing. Um, is it, are cigars more expensive up in Canada than the states? Yes, our tobacco yeah. tax is about 70%. It's insane in Australia. In Australia, you can't even find a cigar lounge. And if you do find one, the entire room, at least the ones I went to, and I assume this is all over, it's whited out. You can't even see a cigar, let alone a cigar advertisement. Mm. And so there's a fella standing behind like a glass case that's all darked out. And he asks you what you want. He won't even let you see it. And you go, well, I, well, I don't know. What do, you, what do you have? And you'll turn a light on. You'll see some. But right. it, sti- it sticks like 50 bucks. Yeah. Isn't that insane? Well, I mean, we don't have cigar lounges here either. Um, for example, you would pay like $30, $30 Canadian for a Padron. <laughs> Whereas in the States, I could get one for $8.99 exactly no this is see this is a more expensive cigar and i bought them in boxes and it was about five bucks six bucks yeah that's not bad yeah see to me that's what that's what i said i need to start getting budget sticks i should shut up living in america i should just be (laughs) glad to pay what i pay right well the the coolest little find that i found in terms of budget sticks was uh there's a costco in miami if you go to it you can find these they're called jose marti uh, they're also from Nicaragua. You can get a bundle of 20 for 35 Canadian, and they're fantastic. Wow. The burn is super even. The ashes are super long. Uh, it's just perfect, and you would never know that these things even existed in Costco of all places. Wow. So uh, I'm allowed to smoke in this building because I live in rundown Steubenville, and the <laughs> landlords are just thrilled to have somebody paying rent. But how come you're smoking inside? Where, where are you? I'm in the garage. My wife, ah. actually, yeah, my wife actually created this space for me. She painted. She did all what the uh, decor in the back. Yeah. 
it's beautiful having our blessed mother back there. It's it lovely. Is. It, it looks is. great too. Good oh, for thank her. You. Thank you, brother. Yeah, she's she's awesome. She's a blessing for sure. Uh, shout out to my wife Tanya, if and when you watch, honey. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So my brother, listen. Uh, what I want to do is we could talk some more about cigars later. But what I what I'm really interested in is I've never actually heard your conversion story. Okay. Um, so I would like for you to just sort of walk me through, you know, Matt Frad's early days. Where did you grow up? How did you grow up? What was your faith life like? And how ultimately did you embrace Catholicism? Yeah, well, I was raised in a small country town in South Australia called Port Piri. Um, my grandma was a very faithful Catholic, statuary paintings around the house. So my mum was a Catholic and I guess decided from the get-go that she would take us children to Mass. Hmm. Uh, even though my dad wasn't a Catholic and uh, didn't go to Mass. So usually every Sunday it was mom taking me, my brother and sister and, and grandma. And uh, wasn't thrilled about going. It just felt like an imposition upon my time. Wasn't sure why my dad didn't have to go. Mm -hmm. um, didn't really enjoy it. I, I never had any bad experiences with priests uh, or people in church. Everyone seemed fine and friendly. I just didn't care. Mm -hmm. But as I grew older, I began asking what I call the deep questions in life, even as a young kid, you know, like, why do bad things happen to good people? And what happens when we die? And how do we know we're not just telling ourselves a story to make death seem less scary? And does right. space come to an end? Like, I don't know, is it is it like a wall at the end of space? If you went all the way up, is mm -hmm. space spherical? So it's such that we'd show back up in the same place? Is, is it something different? And um, I don't know, maybe this is just kids being interesting before iPhones robbed us of that. Uh, or maybe I was just, I think, philosophically bent that way. Yeah. So when I'd bring these things up to my mom and fellow Catholics, would always say something like, well, you know, it's just a mystery, really. You just have to accept. Right. And fair enough, you know, it is a mystery. I just sort of sometimes thought, I don't know. I wish they'd do better than that. Yeah. And to their credit, maybe they did. And I was just too much of an arrogant little kid to listen. Right. But I'd say by about the age of 12, 13, 14, I don't know if I believed in God. Um, I think maybe I was agnostic. Well, I had a very good friend called, uh, well, I've stopped saying her name, so I'll call her Jane. That's what I call her in my new book, How to Be Happy. So we'll go with Jane. Jane um, and I were rollerblading one day, and I liked her a lot because she was very curious about the world and interested in big questions like I was. And we sat down on the side of the curb because she wanted to talk. And Jane said that she was thinking of ending her life as a 12 year old, you know? Oh my goodness. And she was going through a lot of stuff at home and it was all pretty bad. And she wanted to know what I thought of that. And I was shocked and said, you know, you're beautiful. Why would you say that? And mm -hmm. So I proceeded to give her a list of things she had to look forward to. Now, what proceeded is, sounds like a cheesy christian skit or something but i'm fairly certain if memory serves this is what happened i said well next year we'll go to high school you know that'll be fantastic then what well a few years after that you know you'll get your driving license and that'll be cool we'll get to drive up and down the main street like all the other uh, heroes of our little town and then what yeah you quit you know you get a job maybe or get go to uni or you know, you get married, you'd be a great wife and have kids. What's the point? Then what? And mm. I didn't see where this was going until I got there. But eventually I looked at her and said, well, you know, look, everybody's got to die. And so, yeah, sure. Eventually we're going to die. And she looked at me as if to say, do you see my point? And uh, I wasn't really able to articulate it then, uh, but I was pretty sad that I could see her point in a way mm -hmm. that if we're all to die individually and even collectively as a species in the inevitable heat death of the universe or whatever, what does any of it matter? If pain is outweighing the pleasure, why not end it all? Uh, who's to say you shouldn't? So that kind of, uh, that woke me up a little bit because I think I gradually began to see very gradually i couldn't really articulate it till after i was a christian but mm. the most fundamental questions we're all interested in asking like where did i come from and who am i and why am i here and how should i be living and where am i going 
all have dogmatic answers if atheism is true you know mm -hmm. we've been coughed into existence by a blind cosmic process that didn't have us in mind we are merely the accidental byproduct of nature there's no objective meaning or purpose to the universe so it follows inescapably that there is no objective meaning or purpose to your life and so how should you live however you bloody well want you don't have long so i mean in whatever way you think will make you happy i guess mm. and maybe that means you're going to live in a way that people will call virtuous maybe you'll live in a way that's conducive to the flourishing of your group or community but maybe you'll choose to be a, a vicious bastard and who's to say you shouldn't right uh, if you tell me i shouldn't what authority do you have over me and yeah. if you if if you say well it's not just me it's society society is just a collection of views and so if one person doesn't have authority over me nor does society they can do something to me by force but that's not a moral authority mm -hmm. so i think you can be be what we call good you can be what we call vicious if you think it's within your self-interest i don't understand what the problem is uh where are we going and i've already said that i mean we're all gonna bloody die gee whiz that's that's terrifying and not just we like if it was just you and me dustin that were gonna die we could have some hope for our kids and their kids and their posterity but it's not science fiction to say that as the universe expands it's using up energy and will mm -hmm. one day be ruinous and there'll be no human beings left the whole thing ends in a whimper so all right now none of that is an argument for atheism uh that might just be the way things are and we have to get over it but i did i think begin to wonder whether i had any good reasons for thinking god didn't exist that that really i think made me think i don't know gee that doesn't seem like a very good outcome and i don't even know if the arguments for atheism are that good you know i i had some like where is he like if he wants me to know him so i can be in heaven with him wouldn't he see to it that i could have any way to know him know of his closeness right i don't so i assume he doesn't exist or i see crazy christians on television saying crazy things i see hypocrites within christianity and then i see atheists who are acting in a way that i would consider good and moral so you know that's kind of where it started but it wasn't until i went to world youth day at the age of 17 in rome that i first encountered young catholic christians who loved jesus christ and it was their witness that i think led me to really consider the truth claims of christianity i prayed a great deal in rome and asked the lord if he did exist to reveal himself to me in a way i'd understand and then what happened is one of those sort of uh drearily predictable I don't have any good words to make it sound uh climactic it just sort of i came to be aware of a god that existed and who loved me and uh it was like my heart had been existing under a deep frost for years and it suddenly was springtime and i could feel and see and know things that i hadn't before and the world became more colorful and beautiful and i i knew he loved me and I began to pray and use holy water and take the sacraments and learn how to pray the rosary which i'd never done in my life mm -hmm. and that was sort of how it begun wow that's incredible uh world youth day of all things and at that age at that young age 17 you know most teenagers aren't really concerned with existential things like that and uh that's really incredible was there was there a particular moment at world youth day that really struck you that really hit the core of your being and stirred your soul or was it just the overall experience in general well first i should say that i think one of the compelling reasons to go to rome was to witness another country you know it was as mm -hmm. superficial as that i live in australia i was living in australia very difficult thing to travel to europe what a blessing this is how amazing to to hear rain fall on a whole different continent and to experience another language and and maybe to even get with a few italian ladies or some someone else i mean 2.5 million young people were showing up so i thought gosh i might get to meet a girl or something you know so but but uh so that was kind of what got me there i mean if it was in a small town in south australia i probably wouldn't have wanted to go but mm -hmm. 
I don't know, it was the joy of them, really. They were intelligent, they were joyful. I had a lot of questions and they seemed very open to answering them and able. Um, my objections, they didn't find terribly persuasive, nor did I as we began to engage with them. I can get into those if you want. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe I would say something like, um, you know, really, we, we only, the only things we know are true are things that science can show us. Mm -hmm. But of course, that's not a scientific claim. It's a philosophical one. Right. You know, it's self refuting. It, it's like saying, I don't speak a word of English. It's like, uh, or I say, you know, well, maybe absolute truth does exist, but we don't have any way of accessing that. And they'd say, well, is, are you absolutely sure about that? And I'd mm -hmm. say, bugger you know so um things like that uh g isn't religion just sort of culturally you know uh, relevant you know if i was raised in india maybe i'd be buddhist or something right i was raised in a christian family but they pointed out you know that that wasn't very good because that cuts both ways you know i could say well you were raised in portland that's why you're an atheist or something like that and that's not a good argument not um, at all <laughs> You know, so it's just things like that. And and then I began to pray quite seriously. We had this one, uh, had this one experience of walking all day uh, in the very hot Italian sun. And our group came to this little indoor basketball court in a Italian high school. And that's where we were sleeping for the night. And there was a fella, his name's Matthew. He's now a priest. He wasn't at the time. And he was struggling with this deep uh, croup cough. Mm. And he hadn't slept in nights, you know. So this one night, I'm laying on the floor, the hard basketball floor in my sleeping bag and my blow-up pillow, miserable. And I was just wiped out. And yeah. there's Maddie over there, like just coughing his guts up. And I offered, a, I think, a very selfless prayer by God's grace. I said something like, God, I don't mean what I'm about to say right now, or maybe I do, but even if I don't, I still want you to hear it. And that is this. If you just give Maddie a good night's sleep, you can take mine away from me. Mm. And even as I said it, I didn't mean it. I was like, Shh, I hope that doesn't work because I'm <laughs> right. really, really knackered. And, you know, I remember waking up a couple of hours later, two in the morning, and I didn't sleep the entire night. And it didn't occur to me that I had prayed about this until late the next day when matthew told me he had the best sleep of his life oh glory to god it was little things like that that yeah. just opened me up that okay maybe there's more to this christianity that i i'd originally thought and there were moments in prayer where i was just brought to tears uh, at the beauty of god the beauty of his sacrifice the reality that he knew me personally and he looked at us not as a blob of humanity, but individually and cared for us and that this could actually be true in the way that two plus two was four. It just broke me. And uh, I came home from uh, Rome like one of those Christians who's so happy it makes you sick. It's all I wanted to talk about from that point on. Wow, that's wonderful. And that uh, that prayer that you offered, a wonderful example of redemptive, redemptive suffering. Right? That's that's a powerful witness. Even that little that tiny little episode shows, and that's for me one of the thing the Catholic distinctives that shows that it's of divine origin. This isn't necessarily a knockdown argument, but I haven't seen any other Christian commun communion or religion talk about rede redemptive suffering. The fact that you could offer up your your joys, your sorrows, united to the cross of Christ, and you could touch somebody not only that you know that you're close with, you could touch a stranger in Africa and maybe it's not till you reach heaven some stranger will come up to you and say you know when you offered up your kidney stones mm. that was the, that was the means of grace that God used to bring me here so thank you you know that interconnectedness of, uh, of us in the body of Christ and how you know through our union with Christ how we actually impact the entire cosmos it's really an amazing thing um, somebody asks here in the chat nature and grace Okay, this this was it here, actually, right here. Uh, since most athe atheists believe in materialism and scientism, given their sole criteria is empirical evidence, what is the first step in bridging this gap? I don't think that most atheists are scientists. I hope not, because it's just a logical fallacy, and I don't think atheists are stupid. So I think they'd probably say, well, there are other avenues to truth. Science just happens to be the most effective one we know about. 
because it removes perhaps many, if not all, but many of our prejudices, um, you know, and people can repeat experiments and come to the same conclusions and, but, um, you know, but maybe pointing out that there are other ways to come to know truth might be something an atheist hasn't considered. And so you could perhaps talk about metaphysical truths like, you know, when I was about 16 years old, I, I was something of a solipsist for a week and a half. I, I thought that it was possible that I was the only one who existed. I remember standing at my bedroom door and quickly flinging the door open to see if I would catch existence not existing. Maybe it would be just a void and it, it's all a trick. And I said to my one of my best friends, Gareth, in the school library, maybe you don't exist. I know that sounds silly, but how would I know? You look like you exist. You reason like I reason or you seem to reason like I reason. But maybe you go home and when I don't see you, you're not there. Well, OK, I think most of us recognize that, OK, fair enough. I can't actually prove the existence of other minds and I can't prove the existence of the material world. I can't prove that the past is real. Maybe, you know, someone might say, well, what if it appeared five minutes ago with the appearance of age, memories that we never that relate to nothing and food in our stomachs that we never had and technology in front of us that we never created? All right. Is that possible? I, I don't know if it's possible, uh, but even if it is, I have no good reason to think that it's true. So this seems to be metaphysical truths that we're willing to grant, mm -hmm. even though we can't verify them scientifically. I think a lot of mathematical truths are like that. Um, I think I think other truths, too, you know, like it's possible that my wife is a Russian spy and uh, she's never been who she said she is and she's just very good at deceiving me but it's so unlikely that it's laughable and i don't walk around wondering if people are really someone other than they say they are i trust people's accounts so there's like testimony you know there's all sorts of things that mm -hmm. lead us to hold different beliefs and uh, not just science so it might be helpful to begin with that sort of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if I could just interject for a moment uh, to let everybody know, I'm at currently almost 860 subscribers. So if this video helps me get to 1K, which uh, Matt, if you would be so gracious to share it, Indeed. Um, I'm going to give somebody who comments on this video after it's uh, gone live and everything in the comments, if you just uh, type that you want one of Matt's books, I'll give one away for free. I'll send it to you, US and Canada residents. It's on nice. me. I so, thought you were uh, going to say you were going to send me a box of cigars, but that's fine. Well, we could we could uh, talk no. we, we could talk about that. <laughs> Maybe if we get to two thousand subscribers by the end of this day, <laughs> let's do it. Let's do it. Um, yeah. So, how did you eventually make headway into apologetics? Let me uh, let me just share this right now. Honestly, mm. I didn't know we were going live until you said we were going live. So I'm going to go onto the old YouTube right now. Click in Holy Smokes Catholic. And there we go. All right. Let's Welcome see what's this. So we're going to share, create post live now. Chatting. Sorry if this is killing your stream. Oh, not at all, brother. It's, <laughs> it's live. That's what we do. That's the glory of it. All right. So let's see. Let's see. Hopefully we'll get some more there. We got 15. Yeah. All right. Anyway, so I've done that. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate <laughs> it. You said that you were. Uh, you asked how I got into apologetics? Yes. Well, when I got home and had become one of these wide-eyed, crazy Catholics who liked to pray, and uh, I encountered a lot of other very enthusiastic Christians from the Assemblies of God, especially. And they had many objections to Catholicism that I had never heard or considered. And this was before the Internet was in full swing and so didn't have catholic answers at the ready or anything like that so i had to just sort of think through things and look for bible verses and i always found that really helpful and right. the, the more i did that the you know the the more sure i felt of the claims of catholicism and um I, and then i i served as a missionary with this a group called net ministries oh yeah okay I in heard canada of mm -hmm. yeah and yep. in uh, and in ireland and there you you go into high schools like four or five days a week running retreats asking questions getting people's objections and things like that so that that certainly sp spurred the apologetic thing as well 
Gotcha. Um, and what about pints with Aquinas? Like, how, well, first of all, how did you find yourself falling in love with Aquinas? What was it about Aquinas that, that drew you to him? And how did that transition into pints with Aquinas? Well, prior to getting married, I'd never stepped foot in uh, high, uh, college or university. Uh, I moved to America and realized that everybody and their brother had gone to university. It wasn't like that in Australia. At the time, I felt somewhat embarrassed about that, though I now realize that if you haven't been to university, that might be a sign that you're doing better than most of us. But yeah. um, I was I did my undergrad in uh, most of it in Maryvale in England, uh, Birmingham, and then I was at Holy Apostles College in Connecticut for my master's degree and started studying Aquinas and loved it. And actually, I was I started Pints with Aquinas back in 2015. Okay. So this is pre-Trump. Can you imagine a world? It's just ridiculous. Like, I thought Trump was always in president. It's hard to believe that there was a time where... Anyway, so it was... Right. Um, you know, so I, I wanted some extra credit for school and so started that. Um, and was sh I think I was probably... Maybe there was only a handful of pod Catholic podcasts at the time. There was Catholic stuff you should know, Catching Foxes. I think Life Teen had a Bible thing, but that was there was not much out there. So I started this, and uh, as I would go to conferences for different reasons, people would come up to me and talk to me about Pints with Aquinas, and I was shocked that uh, people were listening and that it was mm -hmm. gaining traction. Mm -hmm. um, and so I made. I think a courageous step with the help of my good wife back in 2017. I don't know. I quit my, I quit my job and uh, mm. my wife and I were, you know, it was pretty tough. It was like, we, we weren't going to be making much money. Uh, we weren't going to have health insurance. We had four kids, but I was like, I want to take pints with Aquinas like full time. And I can't do that with the job that I currently have, because it would be sort of deceptive. Mm -hmm. so I was mm -hmm. trying to raise money for a job so I could quit this one. Right. So we prayed about it. So I, I did quit that one. And then I said, Hey, if you want to support me, maybe we could make this better. And people came through. And because of that, all the growth that's taken place, whether that be, you know, getting a marketing team, getting social media team, getting very nice cameras and lights, building studio, all of that is a result of the good, the very good that, generous people did for me you know and giving me 10 bucks a month or 20 bucks a month that that's this is really the result of that and i just just love doing it it's just such an yeah. honor to sit down with beautiful people and talk about the faith so yeah, yeah i'm with you there um I, I don't see I don't foresee myself uh, quitting my job in case my boss is watching I have no <laughs> I have no uh, no intention of doing that I just this is a, a side thing but I love it and um, you know for for Matt's viewers who might be seeing me for the first time uh, I started two years ago and what got me started was my wife actually because she said you need to write a book you need to uh, do a blog post but uh, she said you know you love podcasts so much you're always on YouTube why don't you start your own podcast and I used to actually record hip-hop music so i had a bunch of uh, recording equipment in my basement and she said you know what you've you've put this off long enough i'm going downstairs i'm getting your equipment i'm setting you up in the garage you're starting tonight and i actually did and uh what the the gist of my podcast was see my thing is temple theology that's that's my wheelhouse and so i like to show how the catholic faith is the restoration and fulfillment of solomon's temple Everything from the Eucharist to Marian veneration to vestments to church architecture, how all that's fulfilled in the Catholic Church. And I also deal with uh, spirituality, apologetics, contemporary church issues and stuff like that. So if anyone's wondering, that's my shtick and uh, definitely passionate about it. I'm a former Muslim and Protestant who was originally baptized Catholic as a baby and I came full circle through an arduous journey by God's grace back to the faith of my baptism. So that's just a little, a little about me, not to take the, any shine away from Matt here, but in case anyone's watching me for the first time, that's what I do. That's what I'm about. Was uh, your, uh, was your wife, were you married when you were a Muslim or was this after, did you meet her after you came back to the faith? So what happened is, uh, when we met, I had a weird conversion to Christ in that I met him for the first time in my life in a real sense when I was still Muslim. Mm. And I had found a way to sort of 
Christianize Islam because I wasn't quite ready to give up Muhammad being a prophet and the Quran being scripture. So I basically, through Sola Scriptura, both with the Quran and the Bible, I was able to kind of create my own version of Islam where I would say, you know, the, the parts about the Trinity and the crucifixion, Muslims just don't understand it. You can square it with the Bible and the Muslim traditions like the Hadith that would contradict that, I would just discard them. Um, but that's absurd because that's like somebody going to a Catholic and saying, you know, 2,000 years of your interpretive tradition, it, it's all wrong. And we've heard that before, obviously. So imagine going to a Muslim and saying, you know, 1,400 years of oral tradition through which you understand the Quran, you, you can just discard that and, and follow what I'm pitching you here. It was mm -hmm. really, really arrogant and really, really offhanded. But uh, that's the position I held So uh, when, when she met me. And my wife isn't really theologically astute. I kind of do the heavy lifting, but she has a, you know, so the, the gene, the feminine genius, right? They know, they know nonsense when they see it. So I would, I was able to convince uh, some other people, at least of the reasonableness of my position at the time. And I felt pretty good about that because, hey, I might have something here. People are starting to catch on. And my wife would just say, no, it's not true. It's not true. And it got me so frustrated because I was able to convince other people and I was able to sort of talk my way in and out of things, but I couldn't with her. She said, no, that's not true. That, what are you doing? That's crazy. I would get frustrated at her, but ultimately uh, that caused me to leave Islam in 2014 and do a formal break with it. Oh. And then I went back to my Protestant roots, but this time I embraced Calvinism via the likes of John MacArthur, Paul Washer, John Piper. Um, and that kind of stuff. And then I ran into a debate between James White, who was one of my then heroes, and Tim Staples on Sola Scriptura. And you know how you said, Matt, in World Youth Day, you encountered Catholics who loved Christ hmm. and were, were on fire. I had never seen that. My only experience of Catholics was what anti-Catholic Protestants said about them and the old stereotypes. You know, the, they're the best drinkers and partiers. And uh, when, when they're filled with sins, they just go to confession and they do it all over again. It's like a spin cycle. So I, I never really met Catholics who were on fire until I saw Tim Staples quoting scripture, talking about things I'd never heard of, like ecumenical councils and church history and things like this. And that debate shook me. And for the next year, I was uh, up all night, you know, going on Catholic answers, checking forums and just researching studying until i would sweat literally sweat at three and four in the morning i made an act of faith in 2014 i told my wife she wanted to actually leave me because she said you know i don't know you uh, i didn't marry a catholic what are you doing I, I can't do this and then eventually uh you know through the through the guidance of a wise priest he told me stop trying to beat her over the head with apologetics just be just show show the faith through your actions shut your mouth Mm -hmm. And when she's ready, she might ask you a question that you might plant seeds in her. And then eventually one night after my work Christmas party, she just said, how do we know which books belong in the Bible? And I remember you saying something about Protestants taking some out. What's all that about? Who has the authority to do that? And that was her thing. And from that moment on, she be she began to be open. And we entered the church formally as a couple in October of 2015. Wow. So, remarkable. Yeah. Remarkable. Women don't play, man. I That's mean, beautiful. It's, uh, you know, God bless the Proverbs 31 women of our lives. Well, it's also like a good lesson to those of us who feel ill-equipped to engage with our, you know, um, Christian and non-Christian interlocutors. We fear that we don't have the intellectual wherewithal to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. If only we were Trent Horn or Jimmy Aiken, then we could do it. But alas... But here you are, you have your wife uh, in all humility saying, look, maybe I don't know how to respond to you. I just, I can't accept it. And as you say that, that was probably the most, uh, well, I mean, she's your wife. And so for that reason, it's going to be a, a very uh, difficult thing. But, um, you know, that's good for her. That's great. Yeah, praise the Lord. And, you know, with my podcast, I've even though I don't have many subscribers at this point, I've been able to have people on my show that I would always wonder, I wonder what it would be like to sit down and have a cigar and chat theology <laughs> with. And, you know, you're one example, uh, Dr. Scott Hahn, Brant Petrie, John Bergsma, Jimmy Aiken, uh, you know, people like this who are my heroes that I've actually mm. had the chance to sit down with and, and talk about the topics that I've always wanted to. It's 
it's been just such a great grace and i i i just love this it's such a, a blessing well I, I tim staples used to be my boss did you know that is that right I used to work at Catholic Answers as an apologist for about three years, and I'll tell you that he is exactly who he seems to be. I mean, when yeah. I when I yeah. first met him, I thought there is no way anybody can keep up that level of enthusiasm. He's just a, oh, he, yeah. you know, I thought maybe he was a performer, and he is a performer. It's what makes him such a good presenter. But he's right. exactly like that. He's a good man. Yeah. Yeah, he sure is. Uh, yeah, I've had him on about uh, three, four times already. Nice. Um, yeah, he's a wonderful guy. And, uh, you know, you're exactly who I thought you would be. Just a stand up, stand up, wonderful guy who nice. loves the Lord and who, look, for, for everybody watching, like I said, I'm nobody. But Matt had, you know, the, the grace to come on my show and grace me with his presence and, and do this with me today. So that that speaks to your character, because you could have just said, you know, I don't know who you are. Uh, you only have not even a thousand subscribers, but well, to be fair, I do do that a lot of the time. I do turn away a lot of people who because I, I it is for I'm that honored. exact reason. But I'm honored. no, no, it's you had a cigar. I'm like, yeah, we both that, like cigars. That did it, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, what I wanted to ask you too was um, something about Aquinas that really, and an Orthodox priest actually put me onto Aquinas. Mm -hmm. Um, and David Bentley Hart yeah. and them talking about it. And what drew me to Aquinas was his view of God. Because especially in today's climate where you have the new atheism and you have people charactering picture, these ridiculous ideas of who they think we think God is. Like a man sitting up in the sky waiting to smite you with a lightning bolt when you mess up. Flying spaghetti monster might as well exist. You know, It's that kind of probability. But then you read Aquinas and uh, you, you hear about the ground of being, mm. absolute necessary existence in which everything else that exists participates in that existence. That's that's a game changer. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. This idea that God is just one other item, uh, you know, uh, among many is not the way Christians view God. Mm -hmm. um what's what's ironic is that richard dawkins thinks he knows what god is mm -hmm. and doesn't believe thomas aquinas is certain he doesn't know what god is but yeah. believes <laughs> yeah. isn't that funny so he's agnostic about god's essence but a theist in regards his existence and the reason for that is that whereas i and you and i have a human essence you know mm -hmm. we're a human nature god's essence is existence right and he's infinite in being. And the only way we can ever sort of intellectually, epistemically comprehend anything is by defining it. And that involves definiting it, like right. making it less than infinite so that we can say what the thing is. We can't do that of God. And so therefore can, cannot actually know what God is. Uh, we won't comprehend him in this life or the next. Um, and yeah, I think that more robust, more sophisticated view of God is something that is often lost or was often lost in those initial back and forths between the new atheists and theists back in the day. And uh, I, I see hope for that. It seems like that's changing. Um, and so, yeah, that's that is one of the reasons I love I love Thomas as well. He's very sophisticated. Yeah, very much so. But um he's he also said at the you know at the end everything i've written is straw he was actually a mystic too and i think a lot of people forget that um he wasn't just you know because first you know maybe eastern orthodox some eastern orthodox online uh pit thomas aquinas as the poster boy for rationalism <clears throat> you know right and, rubbish analyticism yeah. and all this but if you read him you'll see just what a mystic and contemplative he was and it's funny because we often get the critique in the West that, that we don't teach theosis. But if you go to the catechism, paragraph 460, one of the mm -hmm. people quoted mm -hmm, exactly that man is God in Christ. That's not just Saint Anthony, that's not just Saint Athanasius. Saint Thomas Aquinas himself says that. Yeah. He's quoted in, in the catechism, paragraph 460. That blew me away too when I first read that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, what's cool about Thomas, too, is, you know, he's often attacked by modern secular philosophers 
and they'll say, well, he wasn't really a philosopher. He was just an apologist for whatever the church happened to teach. But what people don't often understand is, I think the most prominent argument for God's existence that predated Thomas was the ontological argument. That still might be the most prominent argument. Mm -hmm. And Thomas says it doesn't work. You, you would think that if he was just an apologist, at, the, at best, he might just gloss over it and not comment on it and let people hold that belief if they want to. Right. Yes, it doesn't work. He says the same thing with the what's now uh, come to know be known as the Kalam cosmological argument. He was at odds mm -hmm. with Bonaventure on this. He didn't think we should put forth bad arguments because it would make the Christian religion look dumb. Now, I'm not saying the ontological argument isn't good. I don't know enough about that. I hope it is. Um, but that's, that's, that is to your point about the rationalism. I mean, his whole point in denying the ontological argument is, okay, man has a sense about God in the same way that he has a sense about wanting to be happy, but that doesn't mean he knows how to be happy. Men have varying ideas about what it will take to be happy. They deliberate on these things. Mm -hmm. And okay, maybe I have some vague notion of God as other, but that's like saying I see somebody approaching. Okay, well, just because you know someone's approaching, you don't know it's, say, Peter approaching. Right. right. So, and then finally, I would say in his Cantana Aurea, which is a biblical commentary on the four Gospels in which he draws solely from the church fathers, he quotes Chrysostom more than Augustine, yeah. which people often find interesting. In the Summa, it's like the Bible, Augustine, Aristotle. Uh, but he quotes here an Eastern father because, I mean, they're all Catholic. They're all Orthodox, you know, right, exactly. same heritage. Um, but uh, I think that's some, something I often point out to my Orthodox friends. Like, don't just go on what you've heard of him. Give him a bit of a shake, you know. Yeah, read him. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And people forget that, you know, a lot of a lot of what St. Thomas cites are the fathers. Oh, and yeah. Continually. Yeah. St. Saint jo Saint John of Damascus, he was a scholastic. I mean, people bash scholasticism all the time, but it's it can be found in the East as well. And there was a time in Byzantium mm. when Thomas was highly regarded, and people forget that now for some reason. And isn't it true, uh, Matt? Because somebody had asked if either of us had been to a, a divine liturgy. I have personally, but you're uh, you're Eastern, right? Formally now, are, are you not? No, I'm a Roman Catholic. Uh, when I lived in Georgia, the state. My wife and I attended a Ruthenian Byzantine church for three years. Our children received uh, the sacraments or the mysteries, but we never changed churches. Okay. I have a dear friend who's a Ukrainian priest who will go to divine liturgy there on occasion, but I'm Roman. Okay. Okay. And uh, f like, how did you get into cigars? I mean, this this could, be, this could <laughs> oh. be a controversial subject, but I'm just curious. How, how did that oh, start for I you? I don't care at all. Just so everybody knows, I had a cigar this morning, and if I have another one, it's going to knock me for six, as we say in Australia. So I just enjoy chewing on it now. Mm, beautiful. I um, Let's see. I uh, My, my father-in-law was into cigars, and when I first kept moved, well, mo visited and then moved to Texas, he was really big into cigars, and I like the idea of cigars. I like the idea of anything that makes people sit down for a solid amount of time. Yeah. I, I like board games for that reason. I like whiskey and rocking chairs for that. I like anything that's conducive to a good conversation. Right, know? right. Um, so that's really how I got into them. Then I moved to Ireland for three years and I got into pipe smoking pretty, pretty full on. And I enjoyed that very much. Um, but... Oh, and then what happened one day, I was living in San Diego and my wife and kids were out for a couple of nights. Maybe they went and visited family. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm going to go buy a cigar. I haven't had one of those in a long time. And so I sat on the front porch and I had a cigar and a glass of wine. At this point, for some reason, I didn't know you could get sick from cigars. <laughs> right. So I sucked this thing down the way I would puff at a pipe, just continually stoking yeah. it. And yeah. I was on the floor, head between my legs trying not to vomit it was the one of the worst experiences of my life uh so that that put me off cigars for quite a while and then i came back at them with more respect and i just enjoy cigars but the tobacco tastes better that in my estimation than than pipes so i would probably smoke a cigar maybe once a day or five times a week mm -hmm. and uh 
this week, for example, my routine is I wake up, I drop the kids off at school, I uh, I lead a morning podcast for my local supporters, and then I, I'm reading through Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. And so I have a smoke and have a conversation with one of the most brilliant people who ever lived. And it's just very relaxing and I, I, en I enjoy it very much. That's, that's beautiful. Uh, and Gloff says Dustin's channel is one of the most underrated Catholic channels. Well, thank you, brother. I yeah. appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, Logan asks, are there any good cigar shops in Steubenville? My wife and I are coming this weekend to discern a move there. Uh, well, there's about to be one because my friends just bought a cigar lounge on 4th Street. That's the street my studio's on. So I would suspect that within a year that'll be up. But uh, across the river, about... 10, 15 minute drive from where I'm sitting here in Steubenville, there is a cigar lounge. We're right on the edge of West Virginia. So, uh, you know, 10, 15 minute drive across the river, you'll, there's a, it's called Garden Grill Steakhouse and they have a whole smoke section in there. Beautiful. And then Robinson, which is about 30 minutes away. So you'll find something. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, I, I wish we had that here. Um, yeah. I have to go to, to Michigan, but now with you know with COVID and everything that slowed things down. Mm. I actually had a, a, a Catholic men's group. We used to go back and forth between Canada and the States and have cigars and adult beverages and talk theology. And uh, yeah. unfortunately, we don't do that anymore. But like you said, it's just it's conducive to great conversation. And I, I, I just smile because I, when I meet somebody who appreciates this like mm -hmm. me, it's, it's like a kindred spirit. So for me, um, how I got into cigars, yeah, I was 21, and uh, a girl I knew at the time had bought me because I'd never seen Scarface, mm -hmm. so she bought me the Scarface DVD, and I saw Tony Montana puffing away on Cubans. That looks very—I uh, don't know—that just looks like a good time. Looks cool. Looks cool, right? That's good so enough reason. Yeah. I uh, I go into my dad's my dad's office, and he had a humidor, and he had a Cuban are full of Cohibas. They're Cuban. Tony Montana is Cuban. All right, let's do this. It must be a sign. So uh, that's how I got into them. And what I love about them, for me, um, they're often a theological accompaniment. So I take like an hour a day after my kids are in bed, and I'll go out in the garage, and I'll put the scriptural rosary on my phone. I'll, pr I'll pray the rosary. I'll have some puffs. I'll listen to a podcast. And while I'm doing my podcast, obviously I have one. And to me, it's just I don't, something about the smoke rising. It's like to me, it's analogous to incense, and it just makes me ponder the deep things of life, the mysteries of God, the mysteries of our faith. And um, you know, doing that alone, it's it's like recharging the battery. And to, you know, to do it with friends or a friend is is also special in its own way. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not going to tell everybody, hey, you got to go up and so you know pick up smoking, but as a personal choice, you know, this is how it affects me and what I hold dear uh, about it. And, you know, often people will say, well, you know, it, it's cancerous and this and that. But, you know, St. Thomas was all about distinctions. And I like to make distinctions. So in particular, and I might be a little bit biased because I love cigars, right? But um, so first of all, a, a caveat, there is about 400 plus chemicals in cigarettes. Hmm. Right. If I didn't I didn't know that. Yeah. If you're smoking a good quality cigar, it's basically just tobacco. Uh, tobacco, is ha tobacco has been used in various cultures for various purposes for millennia. OK. Um, and I actually have seen studies where they show in in moderation, which one FDA study uh, said was between one and two cigars a day. The rates of cancer between cigar smokers and non-smokers is not statistically significant. It's kind of it's kind of hidden away in that larger study, but that's very interesting. Hmm. So, I saw the same study. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, I, I don't I don't have any misgivings about it. Obviously, if I'm around somebody and they hate the smell, I'll you know Romans fourteen, I'll give up my liberty, right? But um, I just I love them. Hmm. My wife doesn't like the smell of cigars because her dad is a big cigar smoker. And uh, there's nothing uh, so much of a turn off as when your spouse smells like your dad, I suppose. So uh, <laughs> right. So if I if I, I'll come to the studio, I'll have a cigar. Usually what I'll do is I'll go home and I'll shower, 
you know, go, yeah. go on a run or something like that. Um, I think women tend to like the smell of pipes. Pipes usually have a nicer aroma, but I, yes. I, I you know, I, I like the smell of cigars now much more. And uh, yeah, mm, yeah. I've tried to get into pipes, but uh, I, I do like the smell, you know, granted. Um, to me, it's just too much work packing and, and doing all that. I just want to pick up something and go. Yeah. You know? Now, well, I, I have this idea that, you know, cigars are more conducive to conversation. Pipes are good for me if I'm on my own and I'm reading. It's more of a contemplative activity, I think. Um you know, you have to tend to a pipe in a way you don't have to, to a cigar. You can, right. you know, like if this was a conversation right now, which it is, and I was <laughs> incidentally, and if I was smoking a pipe, it would have went out about eight times now. Cause I'm, I have to talk to you. Exactly. Whereas if it's in my mouth, that's how I keep it lit through the air circulation. Yeah, exactly. So I, I yeah. And you've gotten, you've gotten probably some pushback, right? Yeah, but I don't care. I just don't believe people's outrage on the internet. So people are always upset with me, and I, I don't. I mean it when I say I don't care what they think because you can't. I, I just care. I care what my wife thinks. I care what yeah. my kids think. I care what people who I love think, and I love the people who watch this in an extended way. I don't want anything bad to happen to them. I want their good, but you know, I just don't care. So I, yeah, I'm fine. I just yeah. And I don't, and I don't mean that in a grandiose sort of cavalier sort of way. Yeah, like I'm the greatest guy, and I don't yeah, care. I, so you I don't care about either. you. Yeah, no, I just don't care. Now I've heard that two men online I consider to be free men, at least in how they present themselves. Tucker Carlson and Joe Rogan. Yeah, I'm not making any sort of claim about the different things they say or do. That's not the point. But mm. I've heard that neither of them read YouTube comments. I hear that Tucker Carlson doesn't even use the internet much. And yeah. uh, you can tell he's just free. He's goofy and beautiful and he doesn't seem guarded and concerned what you think. And um, when I learned that, I decided months ago to stop reading YouTube comments altogether. So I don't even. Good on you. Good on you. <laughs> don't even. So I have people around me who work for me who will tell me, hey, you went too far there. Well, you shouldn't have said that or you should apologize for this. And I can take those things seriously. But sure. I don't think any human being has evolved to the point where they are in a position to try to handle and sift through thousands of critical or praise comments. You know, No, you, there's no time. And actually, uh, with the exception of this video, I want to have comments on because I want people to comment so that I can bless one of the commenters ah. with a copy of your book. So I'm going to leave comments open in this instance. Okay. Uh, normally, I close them. Uh, not because I'm afraid of, uh, you know, my interlocutors or somebody disagreeing with me. Of course not. I simply, for the good of my own soul and my mental health and my time, I don't have time to sit, like you say, sift through comments, get into debates with strangers and drive myself crazy. I just, <laughs> I, I, I have to prioritize, you know, right. so, so I definitely hear you. That's, that's wisdom. Let us yeah. be attentive right yeah amen yeah <laughs> well uh listen i i'm not too far from steubenville uh ohio is like what three three and a half hours from me i would love to one day possibly sit down with you in person and enjoy a cigar um yeah well I, if you're ever in steubenville let me know i mean i don't has connect has canada opened their borders yet are they yeah are we can in... we can travel oh, yep. that's good yeah but if you know i can't make it in person i would love to uh Come on your show and smoke a cigar with you virtually and uh, maybe share my story. If uh, if you'd like to have me, I'd be greatly honored and uh, yeah. I would love that. Open to that. And then if you ever visit, just hit me up. Would love to. I think sitting down in person is much more enjoyable. So I agree. I agree. Well, uh, listen, brother, thank you. And again, just a reminder to the viewers, uh, if you guys want a co copy, a free copy of one of Matt's books, I don't know. Is there one on Amazon that? you oh. would recommend maybe how to be happy is that available that's the latest one yeah they're all okay. on amazon how to be happy might be the right. way to go all right yeah. well why don't i do that so somebody who, if you guys comment once i hit a thousand subscribers i will pick a random person from the comments canada u.s residents only please i can't afford to ship to china <laughs> um uh, i can hardly afford good quality cigars so be easy on me um i will send you a copy of matt's book how to be happy um just shoot me your email 
uh, if you could, and I will connect with you that way. You can share your address with me, and we can we can do that. So, um, I just want to let everybody know. Um, please support Matt and his channel, Pints with Aquinas, and he's doing a great work. So, yeah, please support him. And you've been listening to Holy Smokes and watching Holy Smokes, Cigars, Catholicism, and Conversation. Let my prayer arise in thy sight as incense. I'm your host, Dustin Quick. This was episode 66, The Pint, The Pipe, or Cigar, and The Cross with Matt Frad. And I, I did that on purpose because um, Chesterton said in Catholicism, three things go together. The pint, the pipe, and the cross. In my case, I don't have a pipe. So I threw the word cigar in there, but same, same <laughs> principle. Indeed. Uh, so my brother, uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. This is bless my day. Uh, I'll remember this. This is a, was on my bucket list to talk to you. So um, hopefully there'll be more conversations in the future. Hopefully we can both enjoy a lit cigar at the same time. Um, but I appreciate you. I love you in Christ. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to sit down with me. I really appreciate it. You got it. Thanks for having me, Dustin. All right, uh, I'm going to end the broadcast, guys, in three, two, one.